Welcome back to Mr. Hassan's Math Channel. I'm now answering question number five from the June 2018 LXLC3 uh, paper, which relates to what we're doing in P3. And this question here, especially the last part of the question, is very much related to some questions which students are asking about in um, the October and January 2022 and three papers, which I'm not able to upload at this moment in time. Um, because they're less than nine months from when they were released, so <clears throat> I could potentially get copyright strikes for that. So I am going to explain on this video some of the concepts you might need in order to answer those questions, okay, in, in those papers. So this is a question about the modulus function, and it gives um, a graph. It says figure two shows part of the graph, the equation y equals f of x, where they've told us that, you know, f of x equals... 2 times the modulus of 5 minus x plus 3. So this is, this is the equation of this graph. Okay, it's a modulus function. Okay, where x is greater than or equal to 0, as you can see, it doesn't go in the negative y part of the graph because that has been restricted from its domain. It says, given that the equation f of x equals k, where k is a constant, has exactly one root, state the set of possible values of k. So f of x equals k, or y equals k, is basically a horizontal line, because k is a constant. So y equals a constant will always be a horizontal line. So it's a line that looks something like this, horizontal. So we've got to see where this line and our graph will intersect in exactly one place. Now we can see that this, this is going to continue on. This graph is going to continue on when x is greater than 0 forever. So this side is going to continue on. Okay, it's going to carry on forever, right? So that's going to continue on in this direction. Let me just make it part of that line. Okay, so that will continue on forever in that direction. So we can see that these lines intersect exactly in one place in this region here okay now at the point where this hits the y-axis where they both hit the y-axis over here this point here that's a point where there'll be exactly two roots okay and the same will be the case there'll be two roots all the way down here okay where f of x equals k all right there will be two roots because it, they will intersect in two places until you reach this vertex at the vertex itself at that point there's going to be one root and below that there will be no roots because they don't intersect at all okay so there's going to be a point here where the vertex is so the y coordinate of the vertex that will be one value of k all right and the other values of k will be from the place or above the place where this hits the y-axis, the y-intercept of this, this curve. So it's from the vertex up to the y-intercept. There will be more than one solution. The vertex itself will have one solution exactly, right? So you're going to have k equals that value of the y-coordinate of the vertex. And then k is greater than the y-intercept. Those will be the places where there will be exactly one solution. All right, so we need to find two things here. We need to find the y-intercept of our, uh, you know, modulus function, and we need to find the vertex. If we find those two things, we can answer this question. Now, the y-intercept is pretty easy. We know at the y-intercept, we know that's when x equals 0. So we take our equation y equals 5, and sorry, two times y equals two times five minus instead of x, we're going to put zero that's inside the modulus plus three. So that gives you two times five, which is 10 plus three, which is 13. So y equals 13. So that's the point 13. And the vertex, as we discussed earlier, is something pretty easy to find. Okay, it's similar to, for example, if you had two times and you had, for example, 5 minus x all squared plus 3, all right? This would be 
a function that opened upwards because if you square this, you're going to get plus x squared, right? If you square this bracket, you have 25 minus 10x squared, minus 10x plus x squared. And you'll see that this thing will always be positive. So you'll have 2 times something positive plus 3. So it's always going to be something that is added to 3. Okay, always added to 3. Okay, it will never ever be able to go below 3 because you have 3 plus this thing here. This will always be positive. Why? Because when you square this thing, even if it is 5 minus 100, all right, that's negative, but you square it's going to become positive. So you're always going to add this thing to 3. The lowest it can ever be is when x is 0. When, well, sorry, when this bracket is 0. When this bracket becomes 0, you get 2 times 0 plus 3, so the lowest it can ever be is 3. Similarly, you know, so if the vertex of something like this is going to be whatever value of x makes this bracket 0, which is 5, and whatever's left behind outside that bracket, which is 3. Okay, that's the vertex of this as a quadratic. As a modulus function, it's exactly the same principle, right? Why? Because this thing will always be positive after you've put it inside the modulus sign. The output will always be positive. Okay, so even if you have x equals 100, you have 5 minus 100, it's negative. The modulus of something negative, positive. So this whole thing will become positive now. So again, this will always be something adding to 3. The lowest it can be is when this thing becomes 0. That's when x equals 5. And what's, what, when x equals 5, what happens? This thing becomes 0. 2 times 0 plus 3, you're left with 3. So exactly the way we find the vertex for quadratics, we find the same for these type of um, modulus functions. Exactly the same method. So I know that the y coordinate of this point is 3. So we now know that the set of possible values of k is when x is equal to 3. And when x, sorry, not x, when k is equal to 3, not x, it's y or k, okay, because they say y equals k. So when k is equal to 3 and when k is greater than 13, okay, when, so this is when k is equal to 3. This is the line y equals 3. And this is when all of this, from, from there, there's one solution. At this point, exactly, there's one solution. But then above this, there's two solutions, two solutions, two solutions. At 13 itself, there's two solutions, but ju just above 13, 13 13.00001, there's going to be one solution all the way up to infinity, because this line continues this way. Why does it stop here? Because the, the graph here, the domain of x is only the values of x greater than 0. That's why we cannot, we don't include this part of the graph. If this wasn't mentioned, if this wasn't mentioned, then our answer would only be, you know, k equals 3. Okay, but because the domain is restricted here, um, there's no negative values for x, therefore the graph stops over here. And, you know, uh, these satisfy that condition that there's only one solution. All this from when k is above, and y is greater than 13, so k is greater than 13. So that, that, that's the answer to part A. Okay, if you want to write it in set notation, you can say k is such that, um, k is equal to 3, and you can say, or k is such that k is greater than 13. Something like that. It's not and, it's or. Okay, so that's the answer to this question. You can leave it, and they didn't say write it in set notation. So if you leave it like that, it's fine. If you write that, it's also fine. Okay, so there's the answer to question um, 5, part A. Then part B says, solve the equation f of x is equal to a half x plus 10. So now we have to solve this equation over here. Okay, and to solve this equation here, what we need to do is, I mean, what I, I always like to do in this, such a case is to draw a sketch. I always like to draw sketches in such questions. It makes life way, way easier. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw the line y equals a half x plus 10. Now, as we mentioned, this is 3, this is 13. So 10, let's say 10 is over here. Well, in fact, I'll draw, I'll draw that afterwards. We have a graph which has a gradient of a half, and it passes the, the, the y-axis at 10. So it's going to look something like this. A shallow gradient passing through the y-axis somewhere up here. Okay. This is 10. Okay. Now, this graph... Well, this line y equals a half x plus 10. Okay. 
y equals a half x plus 10. This cuts the x-axis in exactly two um, places, as we can see. There's one here, and there's one there. Nowhere else will it cut this. Only these two places. Okay. Um, and we can see where those two places are. All right. So, you know, exactly where they are. So let's look at what the positive argument of this graph is. The positive argument of this graph is y equals... The positive argument is when you basically consider this just as a bracket without any change to any signs or anything. Okay. So this is going to give you y equals... That's going to be 10 minus 2x. So you have minus 2x plus 10 plus 3 plus 13. So that's actually this part of the graph. As you can see, it's got negative gradient. It cuts the, the y-axis at 13. So this is y equals negative 2x plus 13. That's the positive argument of the graph. And the negative argument of the graph is when you take um, this modulus sign and you put a minus on the outside of it. So you put like minus 2 times. 5 minus x, you change the sign of what's outside of it, and then you expand. So this is going to give you minus 10 plus 3, which is minus 7, and plus 2x. So y equals 2x minus 7, which is basically this line. If it was able to continue down, it would continue down to negative 7. So this is a negative argument of the graph, y equals 2x minus 7. Actually, it has a positive gradient, this part. So we can see that it intersects in two places. One place where it intersects is where you have this line meeting that line. So when 2x minus 7 is equal to a half x plus 10. And the other place where they intersect is where the positive argument meets this line. So when minus 2x plus 13 is equal to a half x plus 10. So if I solve each of these equations, I find these two points of intersection. Okay, simple as that. So... To solve this equation, I'm going to multiply both sides by 2. 4x minus 14 equals x plus 20. Subtract x from both sides. 4x minus x equals 20 plus 14. 3x equals 34. So x equals 34 over 13. And that's solving the equation. They're not asking for the coordinates where they intersect, just the x values, because they want us to solve this equation only. Okay, now for this other equation here, we want to solve this equation. And what we're going to do is we're going to multiply both sides by 2 again to get rid of the fractions. We have minus 4x plus 26 equals x plus 20. And now to solve this, I'm going to bring the x's together on one side and the numbers on the other. So I have 26 minus 20 is equal to x plus 4x. So I have 6 equals 5x. So I divide both sides by 5. 6 over 5 equals x. So I've got my two solutions. x equals 6 over 5. And x equals 34 over 3. Those are the two solutions to this equation. And that concludes part B. Now for part C. It says the graph with the equation y equals f of x is transformed onto the graph with the equation y equals 4 times f of x minus 1 inside the bracket. The vertex on the graph with equation y equals 4, 4 times f minus x has coordinates p, q. State the value of p and the value of q. Okay, so the vertex, as we mentioned before, is going to be 5, 3. That's the vertex. So the vertex of f of x is 5, 3. Okay, that's for f of x. So this is going to be transformed by this transformation here. Okay, so if we look at the transformation... We're going to say that 5, 3, okay, under the transformation of, let's start with, we should always start with what's inside the function. Sometimes it doesn't make any difference, but there's always an order that helps us to make sure we don't make any mistakes. So the order is always starting with what's inside the function. So we're going to start off with f, x minus 1. And this part of the question actually re relates very much to the questions in uh, some of the newer papers that haven't been released yet. So you should really pay attention to this part here, um, and it will help you hopefully answer some questions you might have from the other um, newer papers that I can't upload at the moment, at this moment in time when I'm releasing this video. So here, fx minus 1, this represents a translation, okay, a horizontal translation, 
uh, by the vector 1, 0. It's always the opposite of what's inside here. So it says x minus 1 is going to be 1, 0 as a translation, right? So it says minus 1, you move to the right instead of moving to the left like you thought you might do. That's when it's inside the function. It kind of does the opposite. So what does this mean? It means the, the y value is unchanged. Okay, so the y value is unchanged. All right, so this y value is going to stay as 3 in this first part of the transformation. But the x value is going to be increased by 1. So it's going to become 6, 3. So that's the first change. That's after the first part. This is like fx minus 1. Now, secondly, we're going to have 4 times fx minus 1. So now we're concentrating on this 4 part now. Okay, now we're concentrating on the 4 part. Now, what does that represent? Well, that 4 part represents, if it's outside the function, we're only dealing with the y coordinate. So now we're only going to change the y coordinate. So before it was the x coordinate that changed. Now it's a y coordinate that changes. It's outside the function. All right. That's why the y coordinate is changing and it's multiplying the whole function. So the y coordinate is multiplied by 4. Okay. So we take the 6, 3. So we take the 6, 3 and we multiply the y coordinate this time. And we take the y coordinate and multiply this by the, the factor, which is 4. Because this is a, called a vertical stretch. Okay, factor 4. Alright, factor 4. So this is going to give you 6, 12. So there's the answer to this question. Okay, the new, the new vertex, okay, is 6, 12. So we can say P is equal to 6 and Q is equal to 12. Because the new vertex, they've said is PQ. Okay. Um, so that's the answer. P equals 6, Q equals 12. And that's how we answer part C. And that, that's the end of this question. Now, this is quite important to know how to, um, you know, deal with this. Now, sometimes um, they might ask, for example, they'll say the minimum point in this curve is, uh, you know, 5, 3. And they might say find the maximum in the curve, for example, minus 3 times F, uh, minus 3 times F x plus 2 for example they'll say find the maximum on this right and they gave we have the minimum this is a different question this is not part of the question that we are answering right now it's extra to help you to understand some of the questions in the papers i at the moment cannot upload so something like this they'll say find the maximum of this curve and they here we have the minimum now what we should know is when you have to multiply the whole function by a negative number it's going to be reflected in the x-axis, so it's going to be upside down. So the minimum is going to become a ma maximum. So when they're saying find the vertex or find the maximum the, the, you know, of, of this, and we know that this was a minimum in the original function, then basically what they're saying is they're saying, you know, find the coordinates of the vertex of this function. Okay, the vertex of this function, which is a transformation of this. So for that, for example, we would start with 5, 3. Just imagine that was a question. We would first deal with the fx plus 2, which would be, remember it's opposite, so it would be minus 2, 0. So the x coordinate would reduce by 2, so you'd get 3. And then this would be 3 for now. And then you'd have to multiply the x, the y coordinate by minus 3. Okay, that minus 3 means multiply the y coordinate by minus 3. Minus 3 times fx plus 2. So multiply the y coordinate because it's going to be a, a reflection and a stretch. Reflection in the x-axis and a stretch. So the y coordinate is multiplied by negative 3. So you multiply this by negative 3. So your answer would be 3 and negative 9 in the end for this question, which is not part of the original question. This is just extra, just to make you understand one important point, which hopefully you can relate to the questions that I'm not allowed to explain to you from the papers which are locked. Okay, so I hope that this helped. Thank you for watching. Other questions from this particular paper can be found in the playlist that will appear in this section over here. Other questions from this topic of modulus functions can be found in the playlist over here. You can subscribe to my channel by clicking on this link and you can watch the video up here which will take you to the playlist 
um, or take show you how to find my playlists easily. Thank you for watching. See you soon.